Yeah, hello everybody. Um, good afternoon. It's actually my great pleasure to um, you know, see everybody of you here and it's actually very nice that so many of you attend uh, this talk today because we have a very exciting speaker uh, today. So our speaker is Jürgen Czarske from Germany. Um, Jürgen is director, chair professor and senator of the Technical University of Dresden in Germany and it's actually an excellence university in Germany. And for those of you who have been to Dresden before, or, or who have not been to Dresden before, Dresden is actually like a very, very nice city in Germany. It has a lot of history and a lot of culture. So if you ever visit Germany, you definitely should come to Dresden. And maybe you can also contact Jürgen if you're there. So Jürgen uh, in Dresden, uh, he directs the Competence Center for Biomedical Computational Laser Systems. And um, of course, Jürgen has um, won many awards and prizes, actually much more that I'm able to count here or to tell you here. Um, just a few, so for example, he won the Liebiger Innovation Prize, he won the Optica Fraunhofer Award, and he won the SPIE Chandra S. Vikram Award, just uh, to only name a few here, and maybe you can tell a little bit more uh, about this later. Um, Jürgen is also the Vice President of the ICO, the International Commission of Optics, and he was the General Chair of the ICO World Congress in 2022, last year, which took place in Dresden, and where actually three Nobel uh, laureates attended this Congress. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend, but I, I heard it was like very nice. Next time. Next time, yeah. Okay. In so Africa. now, I even have a second page here, uh, and it's not... I just want to make sure that I don't forget something. Yeah, oh yeah, very important. Jürgen also published over 250 papers in peer reviewed journals. Uh, he gave over 150 talks. So after this talk today, he will have 151. And he has uh, over 30 patents. Yeah? And um, I have to say, like from my own experience, I visited his group in Germany in December, and it was actually very exciting to learn about his research and to get to know all of his co-workers. And I can tell from my uh, personal experience, he's doing some excellent stuff. And this is why I'm actually very excited to have him here today. So Jürgen, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Florian, for the nice introduction and the invitation. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a, a great pleasure to speak here. It's a privilege uh, in this uh, very famous uh, university and very famous college uh, to give a talk. Uh, yeah, on behalf of my group, I will uh, speak about some of the latest results on uh, making optics better without lenses. Uh, how to realize uh, optical systems where you have not to include lenses or mirrors or uh, other uh, components where you can really get images in a three-dimensional way simply by using a couple of fibers. That's shown here. That's uh, perhaps a commercially available multi-core fiber bundle, um, uh, really uh, a bundle with about 10,000 uh, cores. Each core has maybe around two micron uh, as diameter, three micron as uh, 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 spacing, and if you have 10,000 uh, course, uh, then um, you can get already really good images, better than uh, you are uh, thinking, especially if you do this completely without optics. So here is a uh, design of a new one shown, and this new one is here coming out. Uh, how this can be possible, that's uh, exactly uh, my talk and where we have invented a 3D printed hologram that's shown here and this hologram can compensate for aberrations inside of this fiber and additionally it can image. Okay, yes, uh, Dresden was already uh, mentioned. Uh, 
it's uh, several hours away, uh, also if you take a plane. And uh, it's a city with a little bit more water than uh, compared to Arizona. It's a little bit colder. Uh, and uh, yeah, in this city, uh, we have an opera, um, a Zempra opera, where you can go in and a lot of churches are there and we have we are celebrated a two times postponed World Congress. Uh, it was unbelievable, 2020, uh, no traveling and we have prepared the World Congress three years because it's an, uh, within three year period uh, happening uh, event and the last was in Tokyo 2017 and then we have postponed it one year again, uh, one year and then it has happened with really uh, cool speakers, three Nobel Prize winners and also from here from Arizona where there are speakers and we have had may maybe really uh, the highest uh, quality density ever from 75 years of ICO. Next, next ICO will be in, in Africa, in Senegal. Yeah, Dresden is also uh, the city of inventors. For example, for chocolate, uh, 19th century, or for uh, uh, mouthwash, uh, late 19th century, and so on. And uh, the university was uh, almost 200 years old. The university was destroyed in the Second World War, reconstructed after that, and then uh, after reunification, all employees were fired and a part of them were hired again. <laughs> so really a, a story uh, which is a little bit, little bit unbelievable. And then uh, really Dresden was in a ranking of uh, uh, the German Science Foundation place uh, 3037 in the late 90s. Now it's in Germany place uh, 6 and in electrical engineering uh, place one. That's the Excellence University. 11 uh, universities are belonging to that and Dresden is already uh, 10 years uh, inside of his club. Yeah, we, we are working on uh, bio uh, photonics, on uh, adaptive uh, laser metrology, and uh, I have seen today so many uh, cool experiments, and uh, it was really uh, a very kind uh, lab tour, where maybe I can uh, make uh, during the talk uh, some links, and I will outline mainly the work of a group of uh, biophotonics here. We have five groups working on computational uh, things like also 3D printing of gratings, deep learning. We have a new group on quantum communication uh, with single photons and angled photons and uh, several uh, other uh, very uh, uh, recent uh, paradigm shifts. Okay, after this introduction, I will tell you a little bit about a dream. The dream uh, uh, which is now maybe around 20 years old and the dream was to do imaging and microscopy in a complete new way that you have uh, of course the problems if uh, there uh, is a task to measure inside of tissue labeled or non-labeled uh, properties of tissue what can you do? Uh, you have to change from light to maybe X-ray or maybe PET uh, or magnetic resonance uh, or ultrasound, but it's not working with light, right? So, of course, you can remove uh, the, the skull <laughs> and then you can uh, do a microscopy at the surface. Okay, uh, that's a story of centuries. Centuries where you have done the same. Uh, you have worked in a linear system. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek has invented the microscope and it was a sensation 
in the 17th century because he has said, I have found in the mouth of one citizen more, uh, more living uh, specimen than we have citizen in uh, the Netherlands. <laughs> Uh, so he has found bacteria and, and so on were uh, not, not visible before. Yeah, and then uh, from century to so century, uh, they have really um, grinded the, the lenses better and better. What was the progress? Very, very tiny. So if you image uh, through bone, you get speckles out. Uh, but if you do it in a new way, uh, and this is maybe a, a Cambrian uh, revolution in uh, microscopy that you that you do it in a closed loop that you use uh, neural networks, uh, adaptive optics, and so on. Then you can maybe coming deeper and deeper, and you can uh, image through uh, bones. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, for holography, it's uh, a similar, similar uh, study uh, where uh, it was invented in 1407, uh, 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 1408, but it was not really uh, uh, popular. It became popular the uh, through the laser, and the laser was invented, and one year after, uh, you had really beautiful uh, pictures. And this has then moved on with the digital holography, and today you have a lot of components to do it really with uh, short, uh, single shots, and uh, really with feedback loops. But, but how now to get started? Uh, here in Arizona, you have, of course, uh, experience with uh, deflectometry, with uh, large telescope mirrors, hartmann Scheck uh, sensors, and so on. Uh, deformable mirrors, MEMS, uh, uh, liquid crystal uh, modulators. How, how really uh, to move on? and to transfer this to real-world applications to make really a difference there. Let's go to the golf uh, course. You hit the ball and you think it's lost because it's going to the forest. But the uh, forest is simply reflecting the, the ball. It's not really uh, uh, really dropping the ball down. There is no absorption at scattering. And if the ball is then fired back and the wind has not changed the, uh, the trees, then you have a phase conjugation. And that's uh, now, uh, of course, possible so fast that uh, the ball is fired back uh, during, during one, one cycle of your, of your heart that the, that the tissue is not changed uh, uh, so much. That's perhaps 100 uh, milliseconds, perhaps shorter. So you need to have really fast components or you have to do something completely new. And then you can come deeper and deeper. And that's here the work from uh, my postdoc, Luca, Dr. Kukorakis. He has said, if you measure it, you can correct it. You simply measure the scattering here. And then uh, you take the inverse from this guide star uh, over an SLM uh, back, and you can focus through uh, the skull of bone. OK, that's working. But only for mice, not for humans. Uh, our bone uh, of a skull is too thick. What can we do there? Yeah, uh, of course, now uh, we have uh, really a lot, lot of uh, shortcomings because if you focus through the skull and if we move it only some microns, we need to have a new pattern. Uh, and this depends on the age of a, of a skull. That's a study together with Georgia Institute Technology. Okay, and therefore, I will present you today a different story uh, with uh, the same components, but really in a way that you can go to a hospital and you can use it, and that's what we have done. I will speak about uh, 
digitally programmable optics for multi-core fiber endoscopes. You leave out completely the lenses and you start with the ideas from the golf course. Uh, so we, we measure uh, the distortion and we correct the distortion. That's our first uh, iteration. Okay, I have to first, of course, uh, to thank uh, my, my group, actually uh, a group uh, really which is fighting each day in the lab, especially when I am on journey. And uh, without the group, without funding, without cooperation partners, I would be not here. So thanks to the group and thanks to the cooperation partners really um, uh, really uh, coming with uh, com commitments uh, like um, how to how to do all the things we we are currently doing ex situ in situ. So this was an idea during a meeting with uh, uh, clinicians, and we have thought we are ready for this task. Let's go. Uh, the current status is. You take uh, a part of uh, the brain uh, based on such a biopsy uh, needle out, and then you analyze it at a uh, microscope uh, by, um, by chemical substances. That's, for example, HI uh, uh, histological uh, studies. And if you have found something about the uh, suspected uh, tumor, you have to go uh, again for a second surgery. How to do this uh, during operation? You have to be, of course, very tiny to include in the, in the needle, and that's uh, currently around one to two uh, millimeters. You have to include there your instrument, and then you have to do an optical biopsy. Is this possible? Not if you buy an endoscope. You can see here um, uh, rod lenses, uh, a fiber with imaging, imaging optics, a camera, scientific endoscopes with scanners. They are all larger than one millimeter. And so the question came up how to do this completely without lenses. But can you get an image without lenses? Sure, you can uh, do it by computational uh, imaging. That's the story. Now from the group, uh, led by Dr. Kuschmitz, and uh, you have on the left side the standard endoscope. Here is the instrument. You can take what you want inside. It's simply a box. But here you have a problem. Uh, that's inside of your, of your skull and you have to assemble a lens where you have to do the imaging uh, and so on. We want to do this uh, without a lens. Without a lens in the way that we, that we not only exploit the intensity of the fibers, we additionally use the face, so we have complex numbers. Okay, that's a face array, and that's known uh, in several fields, radar, uh, sonar, uh, so if you, if you want to study uh, what happens in, in your body when you have a face array there, so you can uh, really generate here planar waveforms, you can focus, uh, uh, the light uh, and you can change the focus uh, and so on. Okay, so no pixelation, a lot of lot of advantages. What's not not on this uh, list? The disadvantages, of course. Okay, what are the disadvantages? Yeah, if you if you look to an image, then. Uh, you have now this uh, camera of 10,000 pixels. It's, of course, pixelated. That's the first problem. But the second problem is really an unbelievable hurdle. 
here you have a face image of, uh, of Dresden and what is coming out is scrambled face. It's completely scrambled. You can't uh, control the face at the end of a fiber. You can do it at the, at the, at the proximal, the, the input uh, uh, facet, but not at the distal side because uh, the fibers have different lengths, you have temperature effects and so on. That's shown here. You come with a planar wavefront and outside, what is this? A speckle field. <laughs> it's completely distorted. Okay, so uh, we can stop here now. It's not working. Uh, so we, we can bend the fiber a little bit and then uh, something is coming out uh, which, which is not modulated like this Fresnel zone plate for focusing uh, diffractive lens. Like we want to have here a diffractive lens, now we have a diverging beam. How to solve a problem? By holography. Okay, we start with a beam splitter. We have a reference wave and here we are going to the digital modulator. Here is the fiber the coherent fiber bundle, and then we measure the phase. Is this working? Of course. Uh, we have here the scrambled phase from uh, uh, 0 to 2 pi. We measure that. Then we take the inverse to the SLM, and we get the phase after digital optical phase conjugation as a planar waveform. Okay, and you can see it also here that uh, really the phase uh, jitter is, is very small. So before it was really uh, too pi. Is this a good idea? Uh, not really convincing the, uh, the medical doctors because we have started to get rid of lenses. Now we have a camera inside of the head because we have to measure it on the other side. We need to have both sides of a fiber. Not possible. Okay, so we are again back at the story that we, that we can't uh, really realize such an endoscope uh, simply with, without optical components. Now we have here mirrors, lenses, beam splitters inside. Not possible. We have invented, therefore, a uh, calibration technique for only one side uh, optical excess. We use a kind of a beacon, a virtual guide star. We go through only one single mode fiber to a partial reflector. Important is that we need to have a spacing here. Then we have a reflection, a virtual guide star, and this line is then analyzed here by uh, a uh, standard holographic setup. The light is coming back from the SLM, and we have the focus in contrast to uh, the speckle field. It's working. Is this really ready for applications? No. Why? So it's a, a little bit disappointing. <laughs> uh, yes, but we are uh, only at the part two. So uh, really the, uh, the novel techniques for transfer are coming. Why do we need them? Because we have currently one point only. It's a sending based beam forming. Then we have the next point and the next point and so on. It's, uh, we, we need to have a single shot uh, technique and not a scanning technique. Okay, therefore, uh, we have studied in the lab the memory effect. Who is familiar with that? Florian, of course. Uh, the memory effect tells you uh, something that uh, is uh, concerted, uh, not changed. And if you look to the fibers, uh, you have a fiber bundle and you bend this uh, fiber bundle. Then, of course, the structure is not changed, but uh, the orientation has changed. 
What happens now if you bend really this fiber with the pattern? This was the question and the answer was the pattern is maintained. There is no change in contrast to a multi-mode fiber. Uh, only the position is uh, different. And that's tolerable, not for dimensional metallurgy, but for histological studies of a, of a, of a tissue. Okay, and therefore our solution was we have to discriminate two different uh, shifts. One is uh, really this speckle pattern and the other is the change uh, of this speckle, speckle pattern. So a tilt and this means in the Fourier domain really a change of a point. Therefore, we can calibrate with the SLM and with holography, uh, the fiber, all these uh, really fibers have uh, really different lengths, could be at one meter of fiber, 100 micrometer. That's coming from fabrication, from uh, several, several effects there. So we can calibrate that. And then we have a 3D printed diffractive optical element, the hologram. And this hologram is compensating really in a static way the distortion. Okay, we have started with a student experiment. A student was uh, measuring uh, the face. That's a fingerprint for each individual fiber bundle different. Then he has uh, printed the DOE and he was very lucky. It seems to be working. But I have asked, uh, are you really satisfied with that? <laughs> there is uh, still a high fluctuation. What was the problem? The problem is that if you have the fiber bundle, a coherent fiber bundle, and you print here directly on front of a, of a facet, the DOE, then uh, you have really to calculate the phase steps there. So this means uh, if you have a wavelength, I would say here in the experiments, uh, often we have 600 nanometers and we want to have only wavelength divided by 10, you have to print steps of 60 nanometers. Which printer is uh, really able to do this? Uh, you, you can use a stat printer maybe, a stat two photon uh, uh, polarization uh, technique. Uh, th this is really the problem. We have here uh, quantization errors. We have had only three different phase steps. So it was a kind of déjà vu uh, going back to the 80s, 90s, where the diffraction grating had only uh, a couple of, uh, of, uh, of phase steps. Okay, and then we have further problems uh, with uh, the printing process. The printing has to be aligned really exactly to the fiber cores and we have 10,000 fiber cores. We need to have uh, a coordinate system and so on and alignment issues. Okay, uh, that's the SLM, that's the hologram, that's uh, without doing anything. So there is a progress, so the student has passed the examination, <laughs> but uh, uh, nobody wants to buy it uh, and nobody wants to have it. Okay, uh, so we, we have uh, seen that there is really also a good message. Um, you have not really a, a high uh, quantization, uh, but the pattern shown here can be resolved with a resolution of one micron. How is this possible? We have to distinguish between two figures of merits. 
One is the resolution. That depends on the numerical aperture of the entire fiber and of the fiber cores, both. And the second is the contrast. The contrast depends on the quantization, and that uh, the contrast is not the best here. OK, so um, that's, that's really the beginning. Uh, so if you are a student and you are thinking of mission impossible, think really about the problems. Maybe you find uh, really a reason to write a proposal. If you have no problems, you will get no money. <laughs> and uh, we have done it here. Uh, we have written two proposals, one for uh, a better printing and a second for a better fiber, not to uh, buy a commercially available fiber, really also to look for uh, own uh, drawing of fibers. OK, here is the state of the art. Uh, only three levels, contrast low. And we want to have 20 levels. OK, uh, let's move on. Uh, here is now standing 20, 30 microns. And then we have also here a refractive index inside, so changing a little bit. That's really challenging. Is this possible? It's possible. You can't do it by diffraction limit. But it's possible uh, to, to do it really uh, by um, a kind of a stitching that you are saying, I have not the 30, micro, uh, 30 nanometers in the lateral direction. In the lateral direction, I have uh, the fiber cores with a distance of 3 microns. And therefore, I can do a multi-patterning like at the revolution of uh, uh, 13, 13 13.4 nanometer technique uh, to, to make better, better chips. OK, step size here, 40 nanometers. Uh, very, very close here. Uh, refractive index is very inside. Well, our partner is multi-photon optics. They have really pretty cool femtosecond lasers. Uh, uh, a transparent, transparent uh, uh, liquid where the, um, the really the fundamental wave is not uh, absorbed, and at two photon, at half of a wavelength, you have the absorption, and then you have the printing process. And here you can see we have printed directly on side of a fiber. That's that's our correction. And the correction is pretty cool. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, fortunately, this was not done by a master student. Uh, and the PhD students, OK. Yes, there's a PhD student. She sh uh, he should uh, uh, get a good mark for that. Uh, so here is the really the profile, uh, the design, the difference. You can see it. Uh, it's like a sun. Uh, rising up uh, and you have really uh, here uh, a fluctuation comparable to the SLM. How is this possible? Because the SLM is also not optimal. At the SLM you have uh, a filling factor. Here the filling factor is 100% and so in principle you can, bad, uh, can be better than the SLM. Results. We have now an endoscope which is completely naked, nothing on site. That's, that's, that's really the endoscope in front of a test plate. And uh, we have only here the illumination from outside, but of course we will do this inside of the endoscope. And here, outside of the application area, we have a 3D printed hologram and simply a camera, and here you can see a video. That's a photography or a video through the endoscope of only uh, a diameter of a hair. Maybe not my hair, but uh, <laughs> so a uh, uh, hair of uh, 200, 200 microns. You can see it here. OK, here photography. That's the fiber. Here is the test uh, chart. And uh, you get the reflected light here back simply to the camera chip. OK, that's the end of the story. 
and uh, yeah, uh, we we are looking forward to applications to that. Uh, we can use different different light sources, different. Uh, Trade-offs are there. We have trade-offs uh, which we can perhaps discuss here, and therefore I will switch to a brief conclusion. Uh, conclusion is we can print by femtosecond lasers directly on site of a fiber to correct uh, aberrations. We can band the fibers, and we have still a very very good image. Uh, we are working on twisting uh, to compensate effects. We are working on um, on uh, Nyquist Shannon uh, theorem to do uh, really uh, sampling better than three microns at a wavelength of 0 0.6 uh, microns to enhance resolution and so on. But it's really working from state of the art with a camera. Uh, in the application area where we can get rid of this uh, technique here with, uh, with the lens and we have now here a technique without pixelation and really with also three-dimensional measurement uh, properties. In the last minutes I will tell you two other stories, uh, not so in a detail. Now I have to move on a little bit and then uh, I can uh, tell you um, what are the different pillars. It's the same story to do all with multi-core fibers without lenses. The first is deep learning. Now the story is uh, we do in, in, vi in vivo virtual staining based on autofluorescence. We take the fiber in and we do a near field imaging. We have the, uh, really the image. Uh, now we have only the amplitude. We use a nonlinear uh, deep learning network which can be better than the physical laws. You can achieve uh, also stat resolution there. And then we have a second uh, uh, network for a classification. Very briefly, what is the idea? If you use fibers, then of course uh, you will have uh, dark areas bet between the fibers if you are really in contact. Now we have a spacer and an overlapping of uh, different ex uh, exception uh, angles and therefore you have a blurring. That's on the first uh, few bad. On the second uh, few, you can uh, recover the information of the image uh, by a neural network. And that's shown here with a distance of about uh, 20, 20 micron. Uh, there really you can see uh, the structures without, without pixelation effects. That's a setup with a Zumita uh, uh, fiber, and we use a standard unit invented eight years ago in Freiburg, where you have here uh, really the compression, uh, the polling, and uh, you can do a kind of a segmentation based on that. We have three problems. Uh, one was solved here by the loss function, that's the overfitting uh, problem. Uh, we have a training problem solved by synthetic data and the third is remaining, that's explainability. Uh, okay, but um, let's move on. Actually, uh, we have here the, the unit for the segmentation and then an enhanced deep super resolution network which can really go beyond the physical laws. And that's shown here. We have here the ground truth from microscopy, the standard near field imaging from the coherent fiber bundles. 
here in interpolation, that's a kind of a low pass filtering. Here, that's a Fourier space. It's compressed sensing and deep neural networks is the winner, where you can see as especially the high frequencies are there. And that's uh, really significant for a classification based on a virtual staining, which is label free. The next step is a um, VGG19 uh, layer network. And this is for doing a classification where we have now here the possibility to take the unpixelated data and to do a classification for a tumor. Nine tumors were uh, studied together with our friends from the medical faculty, for example, lung uh, cancer, uh, breast cancer, and very aggressive is uh, GBM cancer. Um, here you can see uh, the spatial resolution, which is very crucial here in this uh, classification. And exactly that was changed here based on our um, super resolution uh, network. And so the conclusion is you can do really both. Uh, you can come into contact and you get uh, a two dimensional uh, image really without pixels and furthermore uh, you have really in uh, progress in the field of uh, classification. That's our setup uh, in use now in at the medical campus. We have a uh, laser diode for the illumination, the tissue, the fiber bundle, the light is coming back and going to a sensor, and then we have the two uh, networks. Okay, that's in scientific reports now. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we want, of course, to go ahead with um, virtual staining here and to have a further pillar compared to the 3D printed optics, which is, of course, more universal. But here uh, we can really face uh, the challenges from, um, yeah, from, from uh, neurosurgery. And that's mainly the work here from Tiju Wong and from uh, Jakob uh, Dremel. Last minutes, um, yeah, an idea um, really on going beyond physical laws, physical laws of lenses, who is familiar with the space bandwidth product? Anybody. So uh, of course, with lenses, uh, you can reduce the field of view when you have a higher resolution. Uh, it's a kind of an Heisenberg uh, uncertainty relation. How to really go beyond Heisenberg limit or uh, space bandwidth uh, limit. That's possible by a diffuser. Now we really move on with a component <laughs> in our application side, and that's the diffuser. OK, it's a little bit a different story. We have a coherent fiber bundle, no lenses, of course, but a diffuser. At the moment, a 3D printed diffuser and uh, yeah, uh, the question is um, how to do a single shot 3D uh, imaging with uh, a higher space bandwidth product. What's the physical, what's the physical, um, really the physical uh, principles behind that? If you have a diffuser, you will get a higher numerical aperture based on the uh, scattering. And therefore, for a, for a given field of view, you can increase the resolution. That's mainly the work from Tom Klosemeyer. And uh, he has started with algorithms known from Berkeley. And then he has seen, that's pretty cool, the algorithms, but only working for the diffuser camera, not for the diffuser uh, endoscope. At the diffuser endoscope, we need to use deep, deep learning. 
we have this uh, single layer perceptron uh, necessary here because we learn about speckle patterns. UNET can't be used there because UNET is not finding a segmentation structure. UNET is the second uh, network. And then, really, we have here a running man. And the running man is reconstructed at the diffuser, so that's ground truth, really with the algorithm, Laura Waller. UNET, not so well working. I've explained it because of the speckles. Uh, single layer uh, perceptron working and a little bit better the combination. What happens now at our uh, uh, setup, the diffuser and the coherent fiber bundle? The algorithmic uh, technique is not working. We have only 13 dB. Uh, unit uh, is not so much better, 14 dB. 19.9 uh, dB, uh, the perceptron. 24 dB, the winner, the combination. Okay, and that's, that's the talk today at Photonics West. <laughs> and okay, the conclusion is uh, we have now, be besides the uh, really the 3D printed optics, that's our main uh, proposal, actually uh, the uh, deep learning based near field techniques, and we have yet now also this diffuser uh, technique. One last minute uh, about the work from JRV uh, uh, Soon. Uh, uh, very, very good uh, pre doc uh, in some months post doc. Uh, he was working on this running man. Um, yeah, this, was, this was an work of two days, uh, and the idea was. Okay, if, uh, if I'm speaking so often about the multi-core uh, fibers, why not to do something uh, with the fibers which is uh, looking nice? And that's the running man, that you are not doing an iteration technique, uh, Gershbeck uh, Sexton, uh, technique where, where you have, where you say, okay, I want to have a running man outside uh, here at, of a fiber at the distal uh, far field in this way, and then you calculate the SLM pattern. N no, you measure what happens as aberrations inside of a fiber, you train the network, and then you can do this with video rates. Uh, for what is it good? Uh, it's good to, to look to that, right? <laughs> uh, Okay, I'm kidding. Uh, it's good for optical forces. And that's shown here. That's a dual beam trap based only on fibers, multi core fiber, single mode fiber. You have scattering forces. And you do it a little bit uh, in an asymmetric way, then you can generate a torque and a healer cancer cell is rotating. You have a um, CT based on holography, and you do uh, a, a computer tomography to learn about the apple's core. You have no missing cone uh, problem like at the scanners, and you can rotate with, uh, worldwide first uh, about all axes. And uh, yeah, uh, now you have to generate patterns to uh, uh, the SLM. The SLM is not shown here. Uh, the light is coming through this uh, multi-core fiber, and exactly this running man is modified now here, really generating the torque. Okay, and this can be used for several. Uh, new applications, uh, quantitative face imaging, now is possible through fibers, through multi-core fibers and also other fibers. 
you can uh, do optogenetics based on that, so you can manipulate also, not only that you see uh, inside of a tissue, you can hear inside of a tissue photoacoustics, you can uh, do brion uh, measurements through the fibers, so you can feel the light, you can manipulate the light uh, with, uh, with the light, the, uh, the forces can be uh, generated and uh, of course, you can uh, smell the flight and uh, several other things can be done. And that's really uh, my world. And <laughs> uh, I have to thank, of course, my group that they have made it possible to present here the results. <laughs> I have to thank you for the invitation and for, for, for coming. It's really a privilege uh, to be here. It was uh, very often in Arizona. Uh, mainly for, for hiking, <laughs> uh, but also for some conferences also here in the city. And I have thought, uh, why, why not uh, to really visit uh, the university? Today is my day for a visit, uh, thanks to the invitation, and it was really a great pleasure for me. Thank you so much, and I'm open for questions. <laughs>